But I'm honored to see all of you and, and uh, some mentors here, some close friends, and a lot of friends who were team members who became almost part of family. Um, I just want to introduce the book a little bit before we, I get skewered by Veer. Um, it's a bit of a chronicle of my journey of 40 years in hospitality. Uh, for some of you who may have read the book, um, it was supposed to be called The Accidental Hotelier because I don't know if I got in there by accident or by force, but then the titles got taken away by some backdrops of my peers, so it had to be changed. And so therefore, check in, never check out from the song Hotel California, which is that you can check out, as I did a year and a half ago, but the business and the ethos does not leave your heart and soul and so the title stuck with me, and that's how the title came about. Um, I've dedicated the book to Mr. Piaris Wilberoy because if it hadn't been for his bludgeoning, his criticism, his critique, his corrections, I wouldn't have learned half of what I did. And particularly in the last five years, when I was the president of Trident Hotels, I spent a long, lot of time with him and his ability to design, define. I mean, he knew just about anything from landscape to food and beverage to design to artwork to grass. Um, and that was an education of a different kind which helped me the next 10 years when I went to Lemon Tree Hotels uh, in a different role altogether. And I started their, their management company called Carnation Hotels and my personal joint venture with them. Over the years, I mean, so food and beverage was not something that came to me easy. Uh, didn't come to me easy for a long time. The rest of it was not so, e not so difficult to do. But, and somehow some mentors used to say, why does nonsense happen whenever you're on duty? So, you know, crisis after crisis or storms after, you know, whatever uh, pieces used to take my ship to. And I was trusted by Mr. O'Broy almost every two years to move on to a new role. Um, and so there were many, many, many learnings. And while food and beverage, as I said, was distant, I had to re-educate myself later because I had to lead food and beverage specialists and I had to kind of retrieve my knowledge so that I could correct them. But what stuck with me is that in our business, we don't celebrate the people who make it happen. Brands get felicitated, CEOs get fated, um, GMs, yeah, sometimes, then we forget them. But there's a whole layer from the deputy manager downwards that makes our business tick. And I don't know what makes them tick to make our business tick. Uh, I'll give you two examples, um, and then it just gets resubstantiated by location, by nationality, and this whole world gets a little complicated. When I joined the company uh, as a management trainee, the Oberon New Delhi, um, still called the Oberon Intercontinental, had 978 people working at the hotel. That's a lot of people. When I went in, into Bombay um, after finishing my management training, the hotel was the, the Sheraton. Just that hotel had 1,578 people. And when the Oberoi came into being at 1986, the total went up to 2,200. That's 2,200 people or 900 people that came in from different backgrounds. They came with less than secondary education, different culture, societal understanding, caste system in their head, no diversity, no acceptance of ladies. How much could you train them in the roles that they did? But imagine that all these people, two thirds or three quarters work you know, during the day shifts in the second, second half, I mean, the one third just stays, is off for the, you know, one seventh of them. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of interactions that happen. Who talks about Kaizen? Who talks about Six Sigmas and HR systems? And they happen well. What makes them tick? There are hundreds of thousands of moments of truth from just a smile or the absence of it. From the touch of the opening of the door to real time excellent service. And we touch and feel every, every department touches customers. And there are multiple departments, different from many companies, MNCs, FMCGs. 
Because even the storekeeper and the purchase person deals with a partner vendor who is actually also a customer. So everybody is customer facing. They do it well, they do it with a smile, and most wonderfully, they do much more when there is crisis and there is a leadership vacuum because you're not in touch because of certain circumstances, some people don't want to help you, make decisions. And what happens is that they come to four. They come and they handle it for you. They teach you so much. And the more you try and open yourselves out to them, the more they open themselves out to you. And the synergies become beautiful. I can, I can only just use that word. And once it comes together, and Beard would substantiate that, he's probably the guru in hospitality, that even the worst of hotels can be turned around by the best leader. And the best hotel can be trashed by a not so good leadership team. And so what makes a leader? It's actually the people there. But as a leader, do you have the opportunity or the thinking process to change your way of working, to absorb what they need and to give them what they need so they can create magic for you? There's no method that people teach you. HR learnings are trash. Bookish learnings that only work by rote. But you learn from them. As long as you're able to adapt and learn, they do so much. The other part that I learned, and, the, and you know, we talk about customization and telling stories, but we seem to do it only for our external customers. But what about the internal customer? We treat them as a PL item, not a balance sheet item. We don't treat them as an asset. Then we find mavericks who are disruptive, they don't follow policy, but they create some incredible magic, as I did have two people in, in Carnation Hotels where we created some brilliant stuff. And it was thanks to a couple of them who were completely undisciplined, um, completely reactive, but their knowledge was more than mine and they didn't come from my background. And so the moment you're able to amalgamate these people, they teach you, you learn from them, but they are the ones who spur you and create success for you. But we never seem to celebrate them. We never seem to teach the right way to handle the dichotomy of different nationalities, different social cultures, different systems, different backgrounds. I wish we did, because that's the way we would create magic all the time. And it's an industry that doesn't get recognized enough, and the people don't get recognized enough, and it makes me very sad. And so the reason of writing all that I did was episodic, because I went through about seven, eight different transformations in my personality, in my style, and I thought, if I could talk about what I learned, it might help not just new leaders or existing leaders in hospitality, but generally I would hope that people in other industries too, even if a couple of pieces would take their ships to a better shore, it would have been something that I would have achieved. But thank you very much. I hope you read it. If you haven't read it, please do. The books are available outside. My royalties on the book are going to a NGO called Muskan that deals with differently able people, largely with Down syndrome. And lastly, I'll talk about, therefore, the experience of Lemon Tree Hotels. And some people here in the audience said I should have written a bit more. But I learned a lot from their business model, which I've spoken about. I learned a lot about running sustainably profitable hotels. But the most important thing for me was the exposure to differently able people, which they do just as as something from their heart, as a responsibility. And I could have written a lot more because I interacted with them, but I must admit I couldn't find emotional words written well enough. And every time I would write about my experiences with them, you know, my heart and soul would not be able to find enough words for it. And I think it is truly a lemon tree story of excellence. And I wish management schools would write case studies about it. I wish journalists would, you know, sit with them and write about it because it's not my story. I adapted to it, I used it in, in the hotels that I ran, but it's actually their story. And I couldn't find enough words to express it adequately, except to say, it's wonderful what they do, and I wish more of us would do what they do, and maybe in a different manner. So, I don't know, so yeah, Dilip uh, expressed that viewpoint.
as did Ajay a few weeks ago and a couple of journalists too, and I had to answer it, the Uber and Delhi. So that's the reason why I couldn't put it. I, I tried my best, but either it was getting too emotional and you know, whatever, or, or it was just becoming like to my credit and I didn't want to take it, it's not mine. And so I had to be a little careful what I was doing. But that was the reason for the lemon tree story and my learnings. Um, but again, thank you very much for coming and warm welcome, Weird. Thank you for helping me do this. Uh, very honored that you did. Okay, you, I mean, I do write about hotels, and though I've been partners for many years with Kapil Chopra and feel like a charter member of the Oberoi family, I am at the end of the day an outsider. So my, some of my questions will strike you as naive, whereas this is an audience of professionals, so forgive me. Let me start with something you said at the beginning. You say at the beginning of the book that you applied for a job at a hotel chain, and this hotel chain, discreetly, and you don't name the hotel chain, and you say this hotel chain had a reputation for only hiring people who were sons of senior military officers, foreign secretaries, that they all had to be tall, they all had to be good looking, that facial hair was discouraged. And it's pretty discreetly done till the next page when you say, so I went for my interview to Oberoi Sheraton. So, it's a, <laughs> so so here's my question. Was it really like that? In some, of you, some of you guys may know. Okay, so let me you know, put both the parts into it. Um, okay. I really didn't know how to write a book, honestly. Uh, so I went by advice. Somebody said, write third party. I said, but that doesn't work. Everybody knows 30 years yeah. in one, 10 in the other. So as I began, I wanted to try and avoid as much as I could. So I kind of, if you, if you see it, the chapters evolve. I kind of got more confidence, say, what the hell? I mean, as yeah. long as I'm not being defamatory, it's fine. Yeah. But that was a bad start because that, I started from that angle where I lost my, my, my kind of sequence. But okay. as, as a rule, it was true. It was true. Yeah, and, and I have people who would confirm that. Mr. Ajay Bakaya, Mohit Talwar, where is he? Um, yeah, they, they come from that generation uh, that I'm talking about. Stephens, preferably. Hindu, maybe. You know, Hans Raj, no, no. I mean, that's exactly how it was. Uh, and if you see Mohit, still doesn't have a mustache. <laughs> um, yeah, and there, there goes Tiagi speaking about the same piece. But that was the rule. And it was true. <laughs> uh, I don't know how you got in. Must have used influence from Mr. Kachru. Galti ho gayi. Go on. Yeah. yeah, so that's how it used to be. And the same as I mentioned to ladies, they had to be a particular height. They had yeah. to wear two-inch heels, particular kind of makeup, particular tone of lipstick because they could be seen above the counter. Um, but that was the rule. But I think it got a little fleshed out, a little changed by the time Tagi's so, batch so came Can in. I just sort of ask the obvious question? Yeah. You've dedicated this book to Mr. Oberoi, yeah. who is a legendary hotelier. Yeah. Why would Mr. Oberoi, of all people, insist only on hiring tall people? <laughs> well, you know, oh, over a period of time, I managed to ask him a lot of controversial questions, and I got yeah. a lot of the interesting part of the answers. Okay. But, yeah, we'll, you know, so even Rai Bahadur is not very tall, but he used to say, hoteliers must have a particular personality. And in, in the persona that he saw, he saw it that way, uh, because they were the operating hoteliers and yeah. innkeepers. And so he thought that personality was the right one for the customer, um, and therefore, particularly as most of the guests were international in nature. It's just something that they identified with. Yeah. So even dark skin at one point of time was not so acceptable. Then it became okay. Uh, so there was a lot of flexing up. In there. So it had to be all... <laughs> no, no, that's not what you I said. You got any answer. I did not say that. <laughs> so it had to be just tall, good-looking, fair, North Indians with a sort of upper-middle-class background. Uh, no, I, I don't think a North Indian bit was there because the same thing was applicable but for other parts. Once you say dark, it kind of rules out South mm, India. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but no, that's not true. That, now, you're, now you're just switching it that way. <laughs> okay, okay. But having said that, um, I think the, as it evolved after that, he said, but before that, hire for attitude, not for looks. Whatever they've learned can be unlearned and taught but they must have the right attitude. So that became the first functional cutoff, and therefore I got in. You've also talked about, I mean, I'm making a joke out of this criteria, but you've talked about how it changed over the years, 
how the Oberoi's were concerned sometimes that their managers should not seem supercilious, should not seem intimidating to their guests, and how a greater sense of humility and service entered the way in which hotels were run. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I think, you know, luxury in keeping in India went through these cycles. I don't know if, you know, that attitude was intended, but it became that way because the choice of the customer kind of made everybody feel a little superior to the rest. Yeah. Uh, and the Indian customers were still coming into fray. There was, you know, there were not so many of them. So I think it evolved and went backwards. In, in the 90s, I think we went backwards. Or uh, went backward, I still say we. And then again, it had to be re-energized as the segmentation changed. And I think the acceptability norms got a little better and more sensible. But I think that's where it came from. It came from a bit of a Caucasian kind of attitude, which, which was something that I guess people have lived their life there, so. You think they were just trying to cater first to foreign tourists and therefore that attitude? No, which at one point in time, Mr. Robert was very clear about. He said, you know, 95% of my customer is foreigner. Uh, and therefore, we must cater to the expectations of the customer that uses us. It's not us who have to define the business. And what is acceptable and right for them and their expectations is who we need to be. But in that part, maybe the slightly negative keep, you know, thing kind of poured in a little bit. But I mean, the way you describe your early years, you were nearly thrown out because you didn't know the difference between spinach and parsley? Yep. Tell us that story. <laughs> so actually, I was doing the book launch in Mumbai, and some of the chefs who are still there and you know part of my community, uh, before I was asked the same question, they brought in a tray of parsley and, and, uh, and spinach together uh, and placed it on the table where I was speaking. But here, so I, I didn't have any idea about hotels, restaurants. I'd hardly been to one. I speak about in the book, and the only time I'd been to a five-star restaurant was when I was trying to woo a lady and I took her for cold coffee into the Oberoi uh, at that time. The restaurant used to be called Cafe, Cafe Espresso, Espresso yes. for some of you we, who know we've them. All done that. <laughs> and all I could afford was cold coffee without ice cream, two straws. <laughs> uh, and that was it. And my dad had taken me once to the Oberoi Hotel in Chandigarh for a meal because we were based there. So I had no exposure and, you know, I could just about make a cup of tea. Hmm. Right? So thyme, bay leaf, parsley, spinach were unknowns. And some of you might remember, you know, like kids were taught with chart paper pictures, A for apple, there was a picture of the apple. A lot of the food and beverage we were taught at that time was like that. And then they gave you cyclostyle notes. Anybody remember cyclostyle machines, right? And the, the things to roll up. All of a certain generation. Yeah, okay, so, it. and then the cyclostyle, you know, notes that you would get would start to fade away. Imagine trying to picture something from a chart paper picture or cyclostyle notes when you haven't touched and felt it. So I remembered the picture of spinach and we were given some ingredients to make a dish with some accompaniments and one of them had to be green. And all I went there, you could not repeat it other than the, you know, garlic, etc. And all I was left with was parsley and of course the condiments. I remembered having learned something called epinard au beurre, which is spinach cooked in butter with a little bit of garlic. To me, parsley and kind of spinach looked the same. In the picture they did. So I made a dish called parsley au beurre. <laughs> well, fair uh, enough, yeah. Uh, but I, my results didn't come out for many, many hours. I was almost fired by the professional, you know, heads of the department and the various functions. But I had a uh, how should I say it, headmaster, you know, head, the dean of the institute called Mr. Srinivasan. He came from an academic background. And he was the only person who asked me saying, why, how, what did you do? And I explained my background. And he challenged me to say, I'll keep you on till the first test. But you'll be the first one to get fired, if I agree with them. But he kept me on, I did all right, so. But you talk about that, and you talk about how intimidated you were going to Five Star Hotel, how you had no experience of the food, and yet, by the time you left, you were one of their best FNB general managers. You're the guy who opened 360. You're the guy who <coughs> opened the Italian restaurant, Travertino. 
Everywhere you went, you created F&B innovations. Even Kandahar, I remember you did a lot of work on. We, you weren't to know then that they would take it out and put a pastry shop in its place. But even so, you did a lot. So how did all of that come from? So a large part of when I graduated and became an assistant manager, a lot of my batchmates and you know other people from the course would f switch between food and beverage and, and uh, rooms. Somehow for the first many years, I was in rooms division only. So okay. whatever I had learned was sitting in trunks as notes. Mm. But as I grew, I suddenly had to be responsible for expatriate food and beverage managers and chefs. So I said, uh, if I'm going to tell them what to do, I'd better learn it all over again. So mm. I went through a whole learning curve for myself. Today, you know, you've got YouTube, you've got Google. When I was passing out, the, there were two books on food and beverage, both were more expensive than my first one month salary. Yeah. So I couldn't even buy that. But now you've got the toolkit. But yeah, so I had to take out a lot of notes, ask a lot of questions, find opportunities to do something for them so I could learn from them. But if I could create value for them, I would learn from them. And so I had to rehone a skill or bring back a skill. So. Okay. You mentioned expatriates, now the Oberoi group. I'm sorry, we're not going to talk a lot about Lemon Tree, mainly because he doesn't in the book. So we will talk about the Oberois. The Oberoi book has gone from lots of expatriates to no expatriates to lots of expatriates. There's been that seesawing within the Oberoi's. What's it been like working with expatriates? And how is it? how does it differ from working with Indian chefs and managers? So let me put it in two perspectives. Um, I, you know, in hindsight, and as I grew now, I probably understand the times of that time. Indian managers didn't really have a touch and feel for luxury, not having, in, you know, touched and felt it in their lives. And everything else that they learned was from catering colleagues or from yeah. the hotel company. But the expatriates had the experience and the feel for the business as well as yeah. food and beverage. And the, yeah. Um, and the global travel. Absolutely. And so we didn't have it. So maybe at one point of time, it was the correct thing to do. But unfortunately, for a long time, we didn't invest in our people too for them to come up to speed. Uh, so many people had to leave. But then as the reinvestments happened, they were taught or they learned. They got a little edgy and so they left. So that mm. brought the expatriates back again because there was yeah. suddenly a paucity of... Local the right level. people, and then it had to be re-energized again. So it was a you know, cycle that happened twice. But I can understand the reason the first time may not be the reason the second time. So. But now? I mean, do you think we still need expatriates? I don't think at all. Uh, the, what's happened is, one, it's incredible how customers, I think, still know more than some of our people do. And these are good people because their exposure is as good as the people who work in hotels. But with the exposure, I think any kind of cuisine, any kind of service level, our guys, both chefs and, and managers, have far gone, you know, gone far ahead of the expatriates. Yeah. And and it's I think the expatriates are sitting in a time warp yeah. and we've snowballed and gone jumping multiple levels. I don't think that'll be necessary anymore and shouldn't be. There's well, more than enough talent. Also, there are enough Indians who now run hotel companies, not just That's hotels right. abroad, yeah. right? Yeah. We've, we've really come of age in that respect. I want to talk a little bit about the Oberoi Sheraton, which then went through many changes. It's now called the Trident. But you have some interesting stories about your time in the Oberoi Sheraton. There seems to have been a lot of violence for a start. You heard somebody had stabbed somebody. There were endless union problems. How did that work? Um, so... I don't know if people have read two books. Uh, one is called Maximum City and one is called Sacred Games. Yes, If we you have. haven't, please read them. And I would recommend that you read them in parallel. Read them together. If you, if you haven't read them, I think I should tell you that they're both about underworld and gangsters. So why a hotelier is recommending them, we'll find no, out. So I'll, I'll, and I'll tell you. I'll tell you about it. Okay? <laughs> it is the true underbelly of Bombay or Mumbai that most citizens don't touch and feel, and the, and the books talk about that part. And these gangsters don't let the normal citizens get affected. But it's also a time in the mid-70s where 
the Datta Samans of the world, etc., had taken the city by storm. And there were enough union activities happening. So the political powers brought in other political powers into play. And so therefore, Shiv Sena was born. Yeah. Um, they, Rai Bahadur and Bala Sahib of Thakre had a tremendous respect for each other. They were as bonded as friends and brothers would be. And so the unions came into play. They were in fact called in to protect the hotel and the company from the Datta Sahamanath violent piece. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah, they were invited so, in. Um, and that's how the relationship actually took forth. Uh, unfortunately, there were a lot of the interlopers from the other side. And so some of the violent people from the Shiv Sena were made part of the staff. But the understanding was that they would be removed, but they weren't. So we suddenly had hoodlums inside who, you know, by habit have to be hoodlums. Um, and so, you know, the atmosphere gets vitiated. Remember, it's 2,000 people, all kinds of static electricity or otherwise down below. Um, and so there are many challenges. So when I when in the first time that is only Shiva Sena and then whatever I've talked about it, then suddenly at the and I had a great great time with Balasa, which I talk about. I think the wonderful and, and human Uttav, being. Who, yeah, and yeah. Uttav, you're very warm. Yeah. Uttav. So, uh, but then Raj Thakre started to create trouble, and he had to be kept out. Then the Ryan Rane's unit came into play. Fortunately, they have a law called the MRTUP Pulp Act for people who are interested that the government protects the recognized union. But that doesn't stop things from happening. And so they would try to muscle in. And therefore, the hotel got divided. The team got divided. Some people were fond of Raj Thakre, some were very close to Narayan Rane and his two sons. And they were virulent people. So inside, at the back end, lots of things used to happen. Um, there, one gang sent in about 180 eunuchs to the hotel. I almost threatened to shut down the hotel and I gone met the CPO and the commissioner of police, which I haven't spoken about. Yeah. But the stabbing incident at Lancers Bar was purely a scrap between two friends that went sour. They were employees of the hotel. Yeah, yeah. They, no, no, they were both members of the staff. That's right. I mean, they it's were very both. odd to go to a bar in an expensive hotel and a waiter stabs the other one yeah, while so you're having it, a bloody so man. This was, they were before the restaurant had opened. Okay. They just opened the doors. I was handing over shift that time. And suddenly we heard a cry of pain, and so I rushed in, and this guy had put a wedge knife into the other guy's belly, uh, and that's where the story begins. But that was a something that went sour between two people. Okay. It had nothing to do with the system or the union. All or the, the unions. Oh no, nothing okay. at all. Nothing. But all the horror stories we heard. And I used to live in Bombay in those days, or how there was maramari regularly at the Opera Sheraton. How if you went to the laundry and you looked in the bhatti, the chances were you would find a body there. This, uh, this was, this no, was no, no. no? So I think those are legends, but let me bring a story from where you mentioned it. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, Shailen Varma is not here. For some people who know Shailen very well, he used to be the duty engineer. Mansoor would remember. Mansoor, where are you? He would remember this. Uh, and uh, the laundry staff used to be not easy to handle. That's okay? right. Yeah. Particularly the night shift guys. And if you were a little more disciplined or you want to correct them with aggression, they would actually tell you. Um, you know, galat machine mein dal denge, to kisi ko pata bhi lagega aap kaha hai. So I think you go by your way, you can complain to the boss, but we're going to do what we do, uh, which is smoke and drink in the laundry. And Mansoor had some interesting, you know, episodes with them at that time. But they would threaten that, or in the engineering, they threatened to put you into the boiler. But somehow, for some clueless reason, and I, I, like I said, I don't understand how I did well with a lot of the people. I had a great relationship with them. Um, so I would go chat with them, the same difficult people, and they were still working with me when I was EVP of the hotel. So I think the atmosphere and what they had to do, what they were hired to do, was a little different. They did their role, but in two parts. But here's my question. You join, you go to hotel school, you join a hotel company, you're taught to distinguish between spinach and parsley. You're probably, if it is the Oberoi stall, fair, good looking, from upper middle class background, North Indian. How do you handle this kind of shit? You have no experience, nothing in your life has prepared you for this. So I think that's what I've tried to highlight in the book, that HR theories don't work. They're written for the books um, and not for any other. Nobody tells you 
how to do. They tell you what to do. Nobody prepares you for what can go wrong. And if suddenly the leadership is either not contactable deliberately, or telephone systems are bad out because floods or rains or whatever, you're really on your own. So you have to find your own way, your own ethos, your own style. And big, that's the reason why I've captured in the book that I had to find my own yeah. way. And the only way to find my own way was to figure out a way to work this relationship with all kinds of people. Uh, and they were so diverse, it's incredible. Where they came from was very incredible. And as, as I got more senior, I was also having to deal with these maverick young people who knew more than me. But therefore, I needed to learn to succeed from them. The how went with them. And if I could create value for them, they created more than enough value which led to my success. But most of it was episodic, you know, one, one little storm to the other. But I think as and now, my storms kept changing, my learnings kept changing, and I used to teach my learnings in the next environment. So some of the managers say, Mr. Kiswani tells too many stories, which I do. But the only way I could relate my learnings was to tell stories. Yeah. Um, and which so, you do in the book as well. Yeah, that's what I've tried to do, yes. Uh, your book is, no, sorry, I want to make another point before that, which is we talked about expatriates and we talked about Indian managers. No expatriate who's run a hotel in Lausanne has ever had to cope with the kind of stuff that Indian managers have had to cope with, right? So I always think Indian hoteliers are the best in the world because the things that are thrown at them, the fact that they have no guidance, there is no course that teaches them this, they have to take decisions on the fly and think on their feet. So I think what you say is totally true. Why did most expatriate general managers not even last their two-year contract? Yeah. I mean, even the best that you would remember were best in the business of hospitality. But unless they had good administrators under them, yeah. they weren't successful. Because this is not something they know how to handle and what to do with it. And, and you know, their ego takes over, their temper takes over. Yeah, classical hotel, yes, of the your. Yeah. And which is the reason why, while they had all the talent and the knowledge, they were not successful in our country. And I don't think they can be, because they don't have the touch of empathy uh, that is needed for this business. Because abroad, it's money, it's hours away, it's bean counters are in the business. I think a large part of the business is in-keeping. And barring some European hoteliers that grew up from apprenticeship, they don't know nothing about in-keeping, even the spelling, so. Yeah. Okay, I actually was not going to mention this, but you've opened the door with Sacred Games and uh, Maximum City. It's a very high-minded and discreet book. There are no bad stories about anybody. Nobody comes off badly in the book. Your love for the business, for the Obroys, for all of that comes through on every page. Which brings me to prostitution. There is a whole section in that about prostitution at the Oberoi Bombay and how the trade was dominated by two pimps and how when you tried to get rid of the girls, as you often did, the girls were willing to go, but if you said to one of them, somebody said to one of them, do you work for X pimp? She would get very angry and say, no, I work for Y pimp. Now, I find this bizarre, so explain that to me. <laughs> <laughs> So I think some of my predecessors uh, from my time in Mumbai would remember. There was a time when the Arab influx happened, uh, which was the early Arab influx. And they brought their harems and they brought their, you know, whatever. And therefore, a lot of the lady, the traffic, from, you know, ill repute, kind of steeped into it. And, you know, what happens is that money gets made by team members and so it becomes yeah. a bit of a license to do business and you have to figure out who's doing that and i remember mr mudok uh, god bless his soul he passed away last year was the uh, general manager and when we passed out and he said you were the guys working in the lobby we've been struggling with this for some time i want to for you guys to put in your best efforts we must eradicate that uh, yeah okay how how do i even identify them what are you supposed to say? Uh, that was not taught. But you were just given instructions. Yeah. 
So therefore, we kind of blundered into that piece. And so we kind of caught the Bangla Biman's wife and found her to be seemingly a lady of ill repute. And then, of course, there was this absolute competition between two pimps that we had to deal with. And, and, and this was a very, very, very pretty, very elegant lady who was insulted after I had asked her to leave by the security supervisor. But she got insulted because almost like a Taj guy being told, you know, you work with the Oberoi. So she got very insulted. <laughs> Which really big, you know, brings in the value for a person's loyalties and the business that they do and the quarter that they bring in. Uh, and of course, I, I, I almost kind of called out my, my colleague's wife uh, because she looked uncomfortable in the lobby. Um, yeah, so but nobody told you how to identify them. <laughs> but you had to figure it out. And then how do you stop a customer and what do you say to them? And if it turns out to be his wife, as it did in a couple of cases, uh, and nobody would come to help you at that time. You know, they were just yeah. not available for you to help. So nobody told you. I remember my parents came to visit me in Mumbai once, and I, you know, what is called furtive glances on the table. And you know, I'd be looking here and I'm looking there. My mom said, "Ladkiyon ko kyu dekh raha hai? Bar bar ladkiyon ko dekh raha hai." So she was finding it very strange. And what is happening is it had become so much part of my psyche that every lady that I was looking at, I was interpreting the lady the way I had kind of thought across my mind. So, kind of stuff, you know? And then I had to explain that to her. She wasn't very impressed with the explanation. But yeah, that's how it began. Okay, I'm gonna throw this open. Any questions from the audience? Okay, let's start with Dilip Puri. So, I think I'm gonna give you a mic, Dilip. So in your case, you probably don't need it, but they'll still give you one. <laughs> So, you know, uh, right through the book and um, even in your remarks earlier, when you talk about, you know, we don't recognize people down there for the great work they do, general managers take credit and all of that stuff. And somewhere it seems as if, um, while I wear my uh, Oberoi badge of honor as proudly as, as you do and most of us here do, but are we unnecessarily trashing the multinational brands here saying they don't do this because your experiences with Oberoi is lemon tree. Okay. But in terms of how you recognize people, what you do for them, somehow I get the sense that um, uh, you might perceive that the other big brands which have come in more recently, 20 years ago, uh, they're the ones Such as Starwood, for instance? <laughs> uh, if, if, if it existed, <laughs> right, okay. I would have, I, yeah, I would have right, uh, lost yeah. that. Okay, okay, right, okay uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but you know where I'm coming from, right? Yeah, okay. I know where so you're coming let from. So let me try to answer okay. in two parts. Sorry. But yeah. No, I was going to say that. There speaks a man who's worked for Starwood and Marriott Cohen. Okay. So headed Starry. And, and headed, yeah. And Taj. And Taj. You work for everyone. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so let me just put it into two perspectives. My, my two experiences really are Oberoi and Lemon Tree. But I had a year with Holiday Inns. Right? I try to set up the systems, work with their systems, or whatever. I had four years with Hilton's. Okay? And I started their systems, they started ours, and you know, we brought in some balance there. My episodic learnings, I can only relate to where my physical presence was. But my statement would still be true, and they'd be brand agnostic. I don't think enough is done by any brand barring to celebrate the success at a certain level and above. Giving certificates and you know little parties and making them travel, do you really touch and feel their soul? If you really look within yourselves, you may find the answer that you don't. Um, 2611 was a big learning for me. You know, and but what, what do I do people do what they do? But pandemic would, would taught me that, yeah, it's the same. And my, my statement in the book is, I wish hospitality industry and all industries would look at team members a little differently. Um, not treat them as a p &L expense, but treat them as an asset. And therefore, you work on the revaluation of your assets. You work on re-energizing your asset. Uh, because they are the you know, people facing team members, but you don't. And COVID proved it. That whatever people might say, platitudes, and I've spoken about it, you've heard me arguing on Zoom calls, I don't think enough is being done. And it's got nothing to do with Oberoi and not an acquisition to anybody. 
but I think I would kind of say we as hospitality need to do it differently and we need to find a new way. Otherwise, no, people aren't going to join. And it's yeah. not because of long hours. It's because it's become reputational. Okay. But it's also true of every other industry too. And Chandra is here and he and I argue about this over a drink many times. Uh, Mr. Sadie used to be you know, the regional head for Record Benkisser for many, many years amongst many things he's done. But it's my feeling of the ethos of looking after people, very general. It's not a particular piece. I want to ask you a question that comes from that and from what you've said. You have, when you run a hotel, three important stakeholders. One is the team who you talked about. The second is the shareholder stroke owner. The third is the customer. How do you order their interests? Who comes first? For me, over the last decade, and I've said this many times, it would be team first, customer second, stakeholder third. The argument because if the first piece works better for you, yeah. they take care of the problem for you. Yeah. you. You look after them well, they look after the customer, who then makes, makes for a return which makes more money. Yeah. But it actually goes in the reverse sequence. It becomes stakeholder, customer, internal customer. But uh, isn't that what's happening now? That's exactly what my problem is. And I, yeah. I don't think it's correct, but hey, that's a reality in the world. Okay. Somebody else a question? Sir. Yeah. yeah. Um, Ratan, uh, by the way, midway th through your book, outstanding. I Thank love you. that Thank call. You. Uh, you know, wh which call would you pick? The complaint, the inquiry, or, uh, or the order? Uh, fantastic. Um, as, you, as you get into a stage where you're here to advise uh, the industry, what are the three things you want them to change about themselves? Sorry, uh, expand the question a bit. So, uh, three things you wish you could have changed in the industry before uh, you kind of, you know, hung up your boots and said... And I'm which the industry should change about itself Thank going you. forward. Yeah. The three important areas yeah. of improvement or change. So I, I don't think it's... So let me, you know, look at it in a different way. I think managers are taught the theories that are relevant to making money and the qualitative differentiation in food and beverage. But because you are, as I would say, of the people, by the people, and for the people, nobody gives you enough learnings or tweaks you around in the true business of what I would call human relationships. How do you evolve empathy? How do you encourage people to be comfortable with you because that is what leadership would then create results with. There are HR theorists, but they give you bullet points that you memorize. But there is no practicality in how to do it. It's not just a problem with hospitality. I think it's a problem across industries. But if there was a way to teach that or how should I say, brainwash so, people differently, but that's culture, it would bring results. But Ratan, that's culture building. I understand. See, again, culture becomes a very broadband, Ashutosh. My problem is the how doesn't come out. When you were born, you were never taught how to handle people. When you were born or whatever, whatever you learned in college or whatever, didn't teach you how to deal with a Filipino also and a Lebanese guy and, you know, and their differentiation, how they think. They all have their different quirks. Or in Sri Lanka, where they won't accept an Indian because I went there after the IPKF operation. Or they told me, listen, Mr. Keswani, when you start teaching, don't start with the statement which says, let's correct what we didn't do right. Tell us two things we did. If we didn't do anything right, create them. Because the moment you speak and say, this didn't go right, we switch off. We know what you're saying is correct. I say that in the book. But we don't listen to you. And I use Mr. Oberoi's words, don't just hear, listen. Right? And you need to encourage the various parameters of listening, adaptation, flexibility, to bring in empathy, therefore bring in learning. And then, you know, everything starts to work as a well-oiled machine. The oil is missing. The machinery is there. I'll take one more audience question. And there you are, ma'am. Let, let me give you a microphone. Hi, Shekhar. I'm all right. Sorry, ma'am. Yeah, I can't hear you at the back, okay. even though we can. Huh? Um, you've talked about uh, facing a lot of storms in your career, but which is that one storm that even now when you probably you're sleeping and you suddenly think of it, you get up with a cold sweat? <laughs> you know, so... Uh, till 26 very, 11? No, no. So, till very recently, I used to still carry my mobile phone to the bathroom. 
Really? Yeah. Oh, oh, it was absolutely. So, I mean, it's, I, I left that habit about a year ago. But it's still, big. it's just so automatic for me. But I would say 2611 and the many hours there. Um, I would never live down that experience. But to again go back to it, what the team did before I reached there and what they continue to do after we were there, why do people do what they do? Yeah. They're not, they were not soldiers. They didn't represent the army. Who did they do it for? They did it for love of the job, for the customer, and they did it. And they put their own selves at risk all the time. And what is even more wonderful, and this is where I talk about people and empathy, every time I'd come out from inside, and you know, my team was outside in the parking lot of the area in the building, there were so many citizens of the city. There was puri idli and chai and coffee and you know, bada pao. Strangers would come out and say, why don't you have something? Strangers would come and say, you look tired, your team looks tired. I have a bed in my house, it's a little two streets away. Come and sleep. You know, I never got their names, but I'd see them the second day. Why did they do what they did? They just came alive for us. They came alive for the team. And the team came alive for the customer. But what happened in there, I will never forget. And it's kind of embedded uh, very deeply. That's it. She's actually asked what was going to be my last question, which is, in 2611, we've heard a lot about the Taj and what they did there. What is less well known is that the Oberoi went through the same experience. And in the case of the Oberoi, again, people risked their lives. The girl who walked people through the lobby, the hostess at Kandahar, who got shot trying to shut the door to protect people. Can you think of hoteliers in any other country who would give their lives to protect guests who they met only a few minutes before and may not meet again? Difficult for me to answer the question. I don't know if they would. I really don't know. Um, no other industry, no? I, I won't be able to answer it. Yes. But um, our teams and the guys at the Taj, I mean, uh, brilliant. Um, uh, Karan Beer and his family. I'll, I'll give you two snippets there. Some of you who are in the business remember Sabina Saikia. Yeah, she used to be um, a yeah. very popular food writer and you know, influencer. She died whimpering in her room because she left the banquet hall to go and get some medicines from her room. And the people that she was in touch with were in touch with me. Okay, so one of my union staff members, his wife used to work in room service and therefore there was this whole conversation happening on mobile phones. The DCP in charge of the investigation I won't take his name. He later on became commissioner of, of Bombay. He came in to investigate what happened. I was sitting with him. And he had been the first leader of the first attack by the police. And he tried to approach Karan Beer's family suite. Now, unfortunately, that's a dome. It's wood. Yeah, it's a lot of wood there. They had no business being there. They should have left two days before. But because of the weekend coming in, they decided to stay on and Karan Beer had to go to Taj Lanson because of a felicitation yeah. ceremony by NDTV. And they couldn't approach the wall of fire. And they tried to breach that wall of fire many times. Most of you don't know this and even Taj hasn't spoken about it. He couldn't. And he could, I'm sorry to say this, and I, you know, it may, might sound terrible. He heard them whimpering and screaming for help, the wife and the two kids. And he was crying in the Trident lobby, telling me how he felt so bad that he couldn't breach the wall of fire. But he could hear them. And he says, Har raat ko mujhe unki aati. Right? But, yeah, so brilliant, the, both the teams, brilliant, you know, whoever led it and what they did, they didn't have to do it. Um, and you know, it's unfortunate, and I just finish with that, most of us forget what people did. And as citizens, the unfortunate thing that people forget, and for some, all the people who haven't read the book, let me ask you a question which I've asked in the book as well. Who was the police person who caught Kasab? We should all remember the person. Do you know his name? For people who haven't read the book. Sudhakar Umbra. These are all the people who read the book, who are answering the question. I, I asked this question at a... Ford Foundation you know, lecture, one and a half months after the attack, there were 600 people in the audience from the city of Mumbai, what I would call the glitterati, the chitterati, and the intelligence here. 
The Ford Foundation person asked this question. Nobody in the room of 650 people remembered the person's name. And that's how sad it is, that we tend to forget. Uh, but that's the true hero. The rest of it won't have happened. Okay. I think you, you're going to meet people over dinner and answer more yeah. questions. Well, thank you very much, guys. We'll just unveil the book. Who's there from the team? Uh, Mr. Kachru, where are you? Mr. Kachru, Mr. Bakaya, could you join Veer and unveil the book for me in the presence of all the friends? Thank you very much.